Roger's getting the camera on while he is. Um, some of you are coming in. I don't know if anybody's here that did not was not in the first or second part except for who's in my living room. I'll do a quick review, not only for her sake but for all of us because it's good to bring the mind up that we're studying Daniel's 70th week. I believe that we will conclude it even with our late start today, <clears throat> but we've got a lot of ground to cover, so my review will be quick just to get us on that same page. Um, I'm going to turn down the fan because I really feel like I'm fighting it. Okay, that's a lot quieter. Are you all hearing me okay? Thumbs up if you can hear me okay. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't just me. Okay, if you need it off, no got an arm. Turn it off. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyone in trouble with hearing? Thumbs down. Maria. Okay. You are our only one. So I'm going to presume it's on your end. Is there anything you can do real quick? You're muted. If you want to talk to me, and I think you're trying to unmute, you can't hear. Okay. Um, Roger, can you contact Maria? I can give you my phone. And I'm going to have Roger call you and see if he can uh, troubleshoot with you because you are our only one. So that says to me, there you are, Maria Bible class. Okay, so he's going to call you right now. I hope you're hearing that. Okay, he's going to call you. He's on my phone right now, so it'll come up with my name. And if, forgive us for going ahead and moving forward, but at 2.06, I feel like I have to move forward. So um, we know you can get it on YouTube later. Good, I see the connection they're talking. Okay, <clears throat> Roger, is the video on? Is it recording? Can you see? I see her. Yeah, but do you see it saying that it's recording us? Can you tell if we're recording on this up here? This, Gina. Is yeah, that, it's recording? Yeah. Okay, all right, we're going to edit all that, but I didn't want to start and then not have it there, so, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> okay, Lord's going to take over. Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, July 22nd, we are in part three of Daniel's 70th week, and I believe it will be our concluding part, we will see by the end, but I think it is likely to be. In quick review, we looked at the beginning of verse 24 at what it meant by weeks, and we saw in Hebrew it meant sevens. So we know in short, we have 70 weeks of sevens, or 70 periods of sevens. As we went through that, we saw that the, this time period that's being referred to is determined or fixed or decreed on the Jewish people. Chapter 9. Oh, nine, nine. Daniel 9. Yes, if I didn't say it, Daniel 9, verse 24. It's being determined now on, on Daniel's people, that's the Jewish people, on the holy city is Jerusalem, and that out of this time period, when the 77s have all ended, we will see the finish to the transgression and the end of sins, reconciliation for iniquity, everlasting righteousness has been brought in, the vision has been sealed up, prophecy has been sealed up, that means it's been completed, and there's been the anointing of the most holy. Now we know all those seven have not happened yet, so we know that we are still looking prophetically. Verse 25, we saw that this time clock was going to start in relation to Jerusalem, that there was to be a decree to rebuild the temple and the city. We saw that there were four decrees in history, the fourth one was the first one that included rebuilding the city walls. Just quote coincidentally, we have that date in history also well recorded for us apart from the Bible telling us that was on March 14, 445 BC. At the end of last class, I was asked about the timing, what sources, how do we know this? There's a lot of complication in trying to go into it because we took that. And let me bring you what happened from that point. At that point, from March 14, 445 B.C., moving forward, we were going to have a period of seven weeks and a period of 62 weeks. Together, that's 69 weeks, so we're leaving out one period of seven weeks. We see that that actually is in relation to years. The, the 69 were years also, not 69 years, but times the seven. 
and so we are seeing that uh, we're talking specifically where the 62 weeks were 434 years when we added it to the 49 weeks which was represented by the seven week period that we come together to a total of 483 years going on the Jewish calendar the, the uh, lunar calendar going by Jewish time reckoning we saw that if we took 483 years, we multiplied it by the days in the Jewish years, we came out with 173,880 days, and when we counted that from March 14, 445 BC, going through, and I'll give you a little bit of what they have to go through in a moment, we came down to April 6, 32 AD. Another very specific date in history, and we know that on that date, there was a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We have Messiah on that date declare himself, not by his words, but by allowing the people's words to take uh, uh, root in, this, in what they were saying being recorded, that they were crying out, Hoshana, save us, save us now. They were declaring him to be their king, and he allowed them to do that. The only time we have that recorded, that the, this anointed one, which is what Messiah means, was presenting himself as king, yet he was being presented lowly on a donkey. We know that was fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy, chapter 9, verse 9, where he would not come in on the majestic horse, ruling and reigning, all of the entourage behind him, as you would expect a king to come in, but instead he would come in lowly. We know there is a second coming where he will come in regality and with all royalty. But here is my point now. If we're exacting on our time, it is showing us how precise prophecy is. That you can dot the I's and cross the T's. That you can count on God doing it exactly how he says. Does he always give us down to the day? No. But in this case, the people could have known of that triumphal entry had they been following their scriptures and realizing what was unfolding before their eyes. Now, if you try to go figure out that date on your own, let me tell you a little bit of what you're going to have to go through. You're going to have to get into the Mishnah, which it is a, a commentary on the scriptures to help you understand the Jewish reckoning of time at that time. You have to go into Jewish customs. You have to observe uh, when they started the count of the days. Uh, the fact that they start at sundown even affects it. You have uh, to translate that into the Caesar calendar, the Sun calendar that we follow, the Julian calendar, because I gave you a date on the Julian calendar. AD 32, April 6th, is not lunar. That is, or I'm sorry, it's not um, Judaic. Uh, we know it was in the month of Nisan. In fact, we know it was the 10th of Nisan. In the year 32 AD in our calendar, I don't remember right now what year they called it in uh, the Hebrew calendar because the Hebrew calendar has been counting since Adam and is almost to 6,000 years. We're at 2020. They're at 5,000, okay, 700. I don't remember all of a sudden. But you can, you can Google anyone who wants what year it is in the Jewish calendar and it can tell you. My point being is you have all these variations coming in. Then you have to deal with the fact that they have a lunar month when they need to get back into the right relationship to the, the moon, to be following the new moons and all that, that scripture tells them, where we add in a leap day every fourth year, they're adding in, and it's something like every 6.7 years, they add in a whole month. There's a lot of variations. So when I tell you that Josephus, in his book called Antiquities, in book number 18, adheres to the, the calendar date, giving it credence. I'm willing to take him at what he said, rather than me trying to get back and figure that all out. And then we have a, a book um, called the Chronicle, or I'm sorry, the Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ by Harold Honer. We have the Annals book, book 15, kept by T Tacitus, I can't even say his name. <laughs> My point being, we have these different historians that are respected, and they're all agreeing on these dates and what's been said. We have all the way down to G.B. Airy, with, who used the Royal Observatory of Greenwich, England, and he stipulated the astronomical year back in March uh, 445 B.C. 
he translated that into the Julian year. He was able, he must have had an amazing mind. And through his, the courtesy of his writings, and he was recognized as an astronomer for the Royal Observatory, he agreed. So we have, you know, the ancient saying and we have more modern saying is what I'm trying to bring out. By the time it's said and done, then you've gone through things like you had to add in these days, and you had to add in the leap years, and then you had to take 476 years and divide it by four, and get the fact you have to add into that 119 more additional days. Do you see the complication? I'm just warning you. If you want to do it, you're going to have put your life aside and have at it. <laughs> <laughs> or you can do simply like I am willing to do and say that with all of this proof right now, I'm going to trust that they are right. The reason why I believe I can do that is because I know God is that exacting. Even in um, the created world, we see that to the point that they see comets that are coming and they know when they were here. And then history reads according to that also, proves that to be true. We take it at face value. Oh, there's going to be a comet coming, not because we saw it before, but because we're told. And then it happens on that day. So I believe God gave them the opportunity to know it exactly because it is that critical of a prophecy. And God was showing them how he is in the detail and how he can give it right to the exact moment. The same way that Daniel's war that I told you about where he gave such detail and they said that it had to be, um, he had to be a historian rather than a prophet. But the scrolls that were discovered were proven to be 200 years before the war, so obviously he was prophet, which also, by the way, just happens to be what Messiah called him, Daniel the prophet. So again, with all of this coming together, we see that God has given us something because this is so important that he, he landmarked it for us. He gave us a, a point that we can really sink our teeth into. Yes. I missed something, like a little detail I know I'm going to be asked about. <laughs> okay. 483 years times the Jewish days. Is that 1,834? Um, yeah. The 483 times the Jewish years in days comes out to 173,000. 173, comma. 880. Okay. Okay. And now, if you count and if you can follow the calendar and, and then go from the Jewish calendar into the Gregorian calendar, you will go from March 14th, 445 BC to April 6th, 32 AD. Okay? So, now that wasn't real short, but that also answers one of our questions from last week. Let me, let me bring this out because this is a question also from last week that I don't want to, to I, I want to make sure I brought it out clearly. We are told, and we just saw this in Romans especially also, and I think it's in 11, it talks about the fullness of the Gentiles. Now the fullness of the Gentiles is different than the times of the Gentiles. So if you think that you're hearing, make sure you hear which word is being said. The fullness of the Gentiles is God calling out of the Gentiles a people for his name. We know that that means that, that he's calling those to salvation. We call those that, have, that are being called out during this time of the fullness of the Gentiles. We call it also the church age. We call it the body of Christ, the body of Messiah. Um, all of these names are synonymous for us. When that body is complete when he the lord has pulled out all he is going to out of that that is when we believe in what's called the rapture if you don't like that word fine the great snatching away that's what it says in the greek but that's when he will call his people home now does that mean there are no jewish people in there no it means predominantly we're seeing the gentiles being reached but the gen the jewish people are in there also because remember paul said we're being sent to the Gentiles that we might provoke the Jewish people to jealousy that they will come into what they bypass and they'll have this for themselves also. So obviously there are Jewish people in there, but the, the thrust that we see is Gentile in its format. That again is not exclusive the same way when God's working in his program with Israel, the Gentile could come into the commonwealth of Israel. They proselyted into Judaism. They, they took part in the sacrificial system to show their faith in the God of Israel and his coming Messiah, his coming 
Savior for the world. So we always have Jewish and Gentile people. There's never a time when one of the peoples cannot be saved. There just never is. God would never close the door of salvation to any who want. Amen. Yes. So when we talk about the times of the Gentiles, we're talking more along the line of uh, Daniel's dream. I'm sorry. Forgive me. He explained the dream, the vision. It was Nebuchadnezzar's dream. <laughs> well, I'm talking about the image. We had, they had gold, and we had silver, and we had bronze, and we had iron, and then we found had iron mixed with clay, and we saw it from the body. Head of gold, the shoulders for the silver, the breast was uh, the brass, um, or whatever word I gave it a minute ago. The legs were the iron, and the feet are the mixture of iron and clay. We can go from Nebuchadnezzar being gold and his kingdom, Babylon, being the strongest. What came up next was inferior. Silver is inferior to gold. That's why it was given silver. It's Medo-Persian. It's why it's shoulders, because there were two shoulders. Out of that comes Greece. But Greece was inferior to the empire that Medo-Persia had. So it's brass. Brass is inferior to um, silver. We come down through the history of time to Rome. Rome is iron, and it, it's interesting how iron was used in Roman age also. We see other uh, side effects like that too, what I'm saying, but again, that's not my study for today. I'm trying to be concise. We have the Roman Empire that ruled. It ruled for about a thousand years. We see that it finally uh, dissipated, I'm going to say, but we're going to see a revived Roman Empire, but it's not going to be as strong as the Roman Empire was, so that's why it is iron mixed with clay. Do iron and clay mix well together? No, they don't at all. They, you cannot mix them. You can't stir them up and see them as one. They, they, the one does not adhere to the other. We're going to have individuality in these ten toes. They're going to give allegiance to the beast, but we're going to see that, that it's not as strong as it was. Now, Every nation that I just listed, do you hear a Jewish nation being head of the world in anywhere in that dream? No. Because it's not time for Jewish world rule. So all that are out there speaking the lie that all the money is in the hands of the Jews, the Jews own all the banks, and if you're suffering any kind of consequences, the Jews are the ones behind it. I've even heard it down to today that the Jews caused COVID and they're doing it to wipe you out if you're one who is losing because they're getting the gain from it. Now, I see you shake your heads and I appreciate that because that came out of the pit of hell. That's another satanic attack against the Jewish people because he has a vendetta against who the Lord says, I will fulfill my word, I will come back. I will raise Israel up to rule, to be the head nation over the world, and through Israel, the whole world will be blessed. Well, where's Satan in that? Is he getting the rule he wants? Is he getting the worship he wants? No, he's not. He absolutely has knocked himself out of any kind of position of rulership, and we know his end ultimately is like a fire. So if he knows that this is God's plan, what's his intent? Let me come against it. Let me stop it from happening. If Messiah is to come back to the Jewish people and I can get every Jew to be a dead Jew, who's Messiah going to come back to? I win. And when Messiah was crucified, he thought he had won a victory on that day. Little did he know that Messiah's death was not at the hands of Satan, was not because he was gaining a victory. Messiah himself said, I lay down my life that I might pick it up again. And we know in the power of the resurrection of life, given to the earthly Yeshua through his heavenly Father in the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. We see the triune God at work, and we see Messiah raised from the dead, and we know he is alive today and will fulfill his word, that this was all part of his plan to deal with the sin issue, and then he will come back in triumph. When he comes back in triumph, then it will be world Jewish role. So when do the times of the Gentiles end? Do they end now? No. Do they end at rapture? No. But do they end when the millennial kingdom comes and the rule of Israel comes up? Yes. Messiah sits on his throne. Messiah is Jewish. Jewish world rule is seen in what we call the millennial kingdom. Why do we call it that? Because God said it would be for a thousand years. The millennial means thousand. Where do we get that? Revelation 20. God said it in, I think it's 14 verses, six times. 
He says, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, and he said it one more time than that. I think he means a thousand years. Mm -hmm. I, I think we can take that to the bank. We're dealing with a calendar here that he was so exacting that he came the first time in triumph, although lowly riding on the donkey, on the very day that God had said it would be, because it would be the fulfillment of 173,880 days. Boom! Here's where it's happened. Now, do we believe that he's going to come at the exact right time once again? Fulfill what has been said? Absolutely. Absolutely. And when it says he's going to rule a thousand years, he's going to rule a thousand years. He's not going to rule 900 years. He's going to rule a thousand years. Then, does he end rule? No. Yeah, you can rejoice. <laughs> I have a question, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> but okay. I'm rejoicing. Later. I'll get your question in one second. He does not stop rule in the thousand years, but we go on into an eternal plan. At the thousand year point, he allows Satan to try to come against him, and that's when he will finally do away with all the enemies of our great God and King and his Messiah, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. So he will always rule and reign. He is ruling and reigning now. The, the plan is what we're talking about when we go into earthly times, because remember, he's above time. He created time for us, but he is above time and has a master plan that's working out exactly to the day. Exactly. Question. Two questions. Okay. One for regarding the fullness of the Gentiles. When it says fullness, um, two things come to my mind. The number of Gentiles, or is it what St. Paul said, established in righteousness? How established are we in that righteousness? Do we believe we're righteous? And we don't think about behavior anymore like we self-condemn like we do now because the more established we are in that righteousness you're focused on that and less focus on the behavior not to say that there's no fruit in the Holy Spirit right right but if it were dependent on the establishment and a process within us I don't know when there'd ever be a time when everybody in the body was established because you've got new ones coming in you've got those who need to grow you've got those who are refusing to grow you've got those who even if you 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 go you try to help them again and again and again they can't seem to let go of that self-incrimination they hold on to it i call it maybe a character flaw that that is keeping them somehow satan has that that link in there so i don't believe it's it's how well established we are. Um, again, also, God looks at us as already righteous. Judge righteous. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so would that fullness in, in the original language, would that be a, a original of some kind of a number? I'm thinking, yes. She's asking the fullness in the original language. Could it be referring to a number? I'm thinking it must. That it, it would be like taking a cup and how much water can you pour in a cup before it overflows? You stop when you say the cup is full. Well, how many ounces did it take to fill it up? It depends on what size your cup is. So I do take it as a measurement. I do take it as a number. Not that there's a magic number that, that God's up there going, one, two, or like when you go into a store like Costco, you see them there with the counter and they count how many people came in every day. Not in that sense, but he has... The, we call it a body when this body is full you know we'll, we'll call water a body of water so it doesn't have to be a body this way we know we're all part of his body we know he's the head and we're his body and that that every part's important whether you're a pinky or whether you're a nose or whether you're another part we know they're all important and they're all forming one body so whether you want to look at it and say that 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 you know there's there's parts of the body still missing because they're not saved yet, okay? Or I look at it more like I say, a body of water, there's a parameter, there's a, a, a great cup to fill. And when it's filled, then he takes us home. So I definitely look at it as being, um, in essence, number related. Can I ask a second question? Sure, second okay. question. Are you hearing her question? If not, I'll repeat it. Okay. Uh, now, this is regards to the times of the Gentiles, and you had mentioned 
Um, we don't have any Jewish leaders, so you know, because it's not time yet, because of the millennial kingdom, that's when the Jewish you know, kingdom, or Jesus Yeah, kingdom. Jewish world leaders. Right. We've got Israel being led by Jewish people, right. but they're not the head nation yeah. leading the world. So we had a discussion before, and I just can't remember. When it came to the Antichrist, more likely it will be a Gentile leader. And when it comes to the false prophet, well, a prophet has to be a Jewish for the Jewish people to be to be believing it. But is it a Pharisee we're talking about? Or what is okay, it? she's asking if we're not into Jewish world rule, then is that, uh, you know, are we talking then that the Antichrist is Gentile? Are we talking that the false prophet is Jewish means prophet? We think in Jewish terms of a prophet. And I'm going to say at this point, you're absolutely on the right track, but that comes up a little later in our study today. All right, folks. So we will hold back on the okay. fullness of that, because remember last week I asked you the question. I said, if you want to, go do your homework. Is the Antichrist Jewish? And I said, I'd answer that today. So we will get to that, um, but we'll move forward in this. Um, my review has turned into some of the study for today, so don't get discouraged and think we'll never get there. This is all part of what we were talking about last week that we have to have lead into this and we need the, the fullness of the understanding so if i don't come out clearly with what you're questioning please come to, you know snag me again but what i'm trying to get across to everybody is god has a time clock that time clock is in relation to israel his clock can start his clock can stop when messiah was cut off and we saw that he was cut off ad um 32, April 6th was the triumphal entry. Four days later, we had the crucifixion. It's Nisan the 14th. I know it better in my Hebrew date than my English date. But we know he when, and this is verse 26, when Messiah was cut off, we saw that the Hebrew meant a violent cut off that fits with crucifixion. And it's at that point that that clock in relation to Israel stopped. Now, do I mean that exact day? Some want to carry it and say it didn't exactly stop until that final rejection that we see when Stephen, Stephen was uh, martyred for his faith and when God raises up Shaul Paul and sends him to the Gentiles. Wherever you put it in relation, then it's in such a short period of time that it, it fits. It's not going to throw our prophecy off a year at all. So I tend to think it really came to a stop at Messiah's being cut off because of that violent cut off. He's not being cut off um, for himself, but he has nothing. His kingdom's not there at this point, so I see it as the great pause starts right there, and then it will start up again when God starts working in relation to the nation of Israel and that final prophecy, the 70th week of Daniel. So we'll look at what starts that 70th week, and that's when our clock will start again. But the start and the stop are ordained by God. It's not that his plan was derailed. It is his perfect plan, which he planned all along to bring in this body called the Gentiles, the body of Messiah, the body of Christ. He was in, it, his intent all along was never to leave them out. But his intent also was never to turn his back on his unconditional promises to his chosen people. He has chosen them, he has ordained for a purpose, he has promises he has yet to fulfill, and he will fulfill those. So we look for the start and the stop in relation to Israel, because really in our scriptures, that's how God gives us the view. You know, everything that happened historically is not contained within the Bible. We could not pick up the Bible if it had every minute of history and fact in it for all the nations and all the world. We can barely hold on to what he has given us in our study. But if you'll notice, it is in relation to Israel. Very quickly in the scriptures, he's promised becoming Messiah. That happens in chapter 3. We've got the creation 1 and 2, and by the third chapter, we've got the fall, and we've got the promise of Messiah. It's specifically given as a messianic prophecy. We see him raise up Abraham, promise he's going to make him father of many nations, but he tells him that, that those who bless him will be blessed, and we know his, we go down through his son, and his son, we come to what is recognized as Israel. So we know it was prophetically speaking toward Israel. We see all the way through 
some like to say, well, the Old Testament's Jewish, the New Testament's Christian, and I say, anathema. Don't, you want to rile me? Say that in my presence. <laughs> because you have grabbed the tiger by the tail. The whole thing is a Jewish timeline, it's Jewish history going all the way through, but it is never a separation. It's never that a Jewish person has to turn from being Jewish. They cannot, any more than a Filipino can turn from being Filipino, Korean from being Korean, uh, a Chinese from being Chinese. They are Jewish. They complete their faith. They go on into belief. Then it's Jewish Christianity, Judeo Christianity, Messianic Judaism. These are all terms that we can we can fight over the details, but in essence, they're they're talking about the same thing. And as we move through the scriptures, we see what's called the new was promised in what you call the old, what I call the original, because that takes away that thought that old is antiquated, it's gone. We see much of the new based on what is in the original. We see a, a completion, a working together, the story goes on. We have all the new written by Jewish authors. We have it in relation to Israel still, and we have the final book being the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. Now, how much more Jewish can it get than that? <laughs> so it's, it's not a, a, you can separate the two. You cannot. Remember completion, not conversion. Converting is turning. If you have someone who is in the Muslim belief, they convert because they will turn their back on all the Muslim belief. Muslim belief worships Allah. That is their God. They're not going to worship that God anymore when they come into Christianity. They're going to worship the one true and living God who, oh, by the way, just happens to be the God of Israel. So how can you stop Jewishness when you're believing in the, the, the Jewish God who, when he took on human form, took it on in the Jewish race? You can't. It, it just It's nonsense to say differently. But a Muslim will convert. A Jewish person will complete when they come to faith in the Jewish Messiah. Okay, that was a little sidelight. Give it to you for free. Hope you like it. <laughs> okay, so we have the time clock being stopped. Um, the time clock will begin again, and I guess we are. I think we talked about this last week. Um, maybe we didn't. Maybe this. I'm trying to remember. Oh, I know where we're picking up. So we did talk about this. Yes, we did. We went through this also that we have this body of. Um, of Messiah, the fullness of the Gentiles, we have it being shown to us that when it is completed, God takes us home. That's called the rapture. That's what we just talked about shortly. And when that ends, it's like that parenthesis around the time that God's working in direct relation to Israel and her promises that he's given to her, now that's when the clock starts ticking again. We saw that as we looked at the olive tree, at the moving of the original branches to graft in the Gentile. They were warned, though, don't boast against the, the, the Jewish, saying, look at us, we're better than you, because it's not you, it's the root, it's Yeshua, Jesus. And if he cut off the, the original because they didn't have faith and weren't walking with him, how much quicker he'd do it to this that he's brought in. Well, we followed that through. We saw that the two come together. We saw that they grow together. One new man, Jewish and Gentile, in this body are uh, come to the Lord in the same way. And then we talked about how this will end when a member is brought up, when that cup is full, when that body is complete. And we go on then to see that God restores uh, his, his working in relation to Israel. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, I wanted to bring in. Remember the new level of grafting that I was introduced to. Can that tree go back? Can it revert to the original in its appearance? And it was said that it can if there's such a severe pruning that it causes the tree to come back to its root and then it shoots out from that root again, not from the grafted area. It's as if that grafted area has been cut off. And we do see the rapture, the snatching away, being a violent pulling out that would allow us to see, taking it to that level, once again, that we're seeing that that tree is reverting back to the original plan 
where we're going through again with what God had promised uh, for Israel. Dr. McGee put it that it was a train going down the track. The train derailed for a time. It's sitting on the side rail while another train passes by and then it's being brought back in. If that's easier for you to see and understand, we're saying the same thing. Okay? So, the church age has ended. It's ended in rapture. And now God is showing that he is working in relation to his program, his plan with Israel. Keep in mind, salvation all the way through is only by the name Yeshua. One name under heaven whereby man can be saved and must be saved. And that's true from Adam to whoever the last person will be on this earth. Always true. When I say that his program, his, his, who he's working through and in relation to, that's where we see the change. Again, the times of the Gentiles, now it will come into the times of the Jews. So we see that change. But the question is then asked, can we get this, can we have this stop in the middle of this verse? We have Messiah being cut off, verse 26. Can we say that the clock stops and starts again? Do we see other scriptures do that? Because remember, we don't want to grab one scripture and build a whole doctrine on it. We want to see in relation to other scripture. So do we ever see a time gap given in other scriptures? While there are many, I'm going to draw your attention to just four because these four, I think, serve our purpose the best with what we're in relation to. So the first one, go with me. I'm going to see if I can call up. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm trying to get a second Bible open. Um, and if I do, then I can do it faster. Go with me while I'm trying to do it to Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Okay? Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. And, oh good, it worked. So... I'm calling it up, and after this, I will be a lot faster to be right there with you. Isaiah 9, verse 6. This is a verse you're very, very familiar with. Many times, especially at the end of our year, at our Christmas time, it's quoted all over. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Remember, right there we see prophecy, because the child was born, what took on the, the human flesh, that part was born. That's what was inseminated in Miriam by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. The Son always existed. The Son of God always was. The Son of God in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And we know the Word tabernacled and dwelt among them in verse 14 of John 1. That is obviously the Son who came and tabernacled with us. So. The son that was given to us, we know, is speaking of Messiah. Okay? Now, we know he was born. We know he lived here on this earth. We know he died, resurrected, and ascended back into heaven. So, when it says in verse 6, the same verse we're in, the government will rest on his shoulders, when did we see the government, the rule of government, rest on the shoulders of Messiah in his earthly life? No answer? Because it didn't happen. We don't see him in that role. It makes it very specific. His name is going to be called, and in the Hebrew, is actually a wonder of a counselor. Now, he's wonderful and he is counselor, so I don't care which way you take it, separate the words or put them together. But he'd be a wonderful counselor. Mighty God equates him equal with God. Eternal Father tells us he came before eternity. Prince of Peace. This is the one who brings shalom. If I gave it to you in the words in our Hebrew, we have Pela Ya'utz, El Gabor, Abiyad, Sar Shalom. Wonder of Counselor, Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, and the Prince of Peace. All names that tell us of the deity of this one. All names speaking to who he is, that he is God. And in his earthly form, the son and the child, we're going to see the government in this manner. Verse 7 tells us there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Well, if it started, I sure don't see it increasing and I sure don't see peace, but we know it didn't even start yet, okay? On the throne of David and over his kingdom. Is there Messiah sitting on David's throne today? No, we know that's future. To establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. And then notice the key phrase. 
from then on and forever, forevermore. So if it had happened, it needs to be still continuing. It's not going to start and stop. It's going to go forevermore. All this proved to me that six is true. He has been born, but the rest of six is still waiting. We have a gap that right now is close to 2,000 years in time, and it hasn't ended yet. Go with me now to Yeshaya, Isaiah chapter 61. And we're going to look at the first two verses there. Isaiah chapter 61 says, The spirit of Adonai Elohim, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because Adonai, the Lord, has, appoint, has anointed me. Now, who did the Lord, who did um, Adonai Elohim, the Lord God, who did he anoint? He anointed Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. So it's talking about the Messiah. The Lord's anointed the Messiah. He has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. Did he do that? Did he bring good news to those who were suffering? Absolutely he did. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Do we see in Messiah's earthly ministry brokenhearted people brought back to, to fullness of life? We see many miracles, don't we? To proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to the prisoners. Did he set them free, free from their sin? free from the eternal separation, that, that the sentence of death that they were under. We see all of that. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That was a favorable time. Yes, we see the year of the Lord being declared in all of these aspects. But then notice the next phrase, and I am in verse 2. And the day of vengeance of our God. Now remember some of the names for the tribulation talk about the vengeance of God, the wrath of God, the indignation of God. Have we seen the day of vengeance of our God? No. We have a gap between 61, well, between actually the two phrases in verse 2. We have a time gap again. When he did all of his work on earth, and we're still waiting for this vengeance of, of God to be poured out, we know there's about a 2,000-year gap right now. Hold on to that in your memory. Don't forget that because we're going to go to Luke 4 where he quotes Isaiah 61 in just a moment. So remember especially that, that verse 2, okay? To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Hold on to that. Sidetrack on the way to, uh, to Luke. Stop off with me in Zechariah, Zechariah. I quoted this verse earlier for us in study today. It's why I want you to look at it and see it with me. Zechariah chapter 9. And verse 6, and what did I get? Because I didn't get, I'm sorry, verse 9. 9 and verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Who's the daughter of Zion? Jerusalem. Okay, that we just know that from scripture all over. The next phrase tells you, shout and triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. So we know who he's talking to. Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. King Messiah is coming. He is coming. He's just coming. He's endowed with salvation. That means he has salvation to give. We know he came with ability to save. We know he did save. We know that he saved people from their sins. Remember when he healed the one that was sick? He said, is it harder to say you're healed of your sins or you're healed of your sickness? And he said, of course, the harder is the healing of the sins, but I'll show you the sins are healed because I'm going to heal his sickness also. So we know he saved. We know he healed. And he is coming. Notice how he's coming. Humble, mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We talked about this. This was A.D. 6 of April 32. I said that backwards. April 6, 32 A.D. <laughs> okay? That this was fulfilled. We know that. Okay? We see that part. Now, verse 10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Yerushalayim. The bow of war will be cut off, and he will speak shalom, peace to the nations. His dominion, this one who, this king that we've described in verse 9, who is going to stop war, he's going to stop the, the chariot and the horse, that's elements of war in, a, in the area of Ephraim, that's in Israel, in the area of Jerusalem. The bow of war is cut off, he will speak shalom or peace to the nations. His dominion will be from sea to sea. And even if you just take it there from the Mediterranean to, um, oh, what's on the other side? Whatever you want, okay? Just fill in another sea. I, my mind's spinning too fast. And from the river to the ends of the earth. 
When it sits to the ends of the earth, now you could take it from one sea, you could take it from the Atlantic, go all the way around the world and come back to whatever is just before the Atlantic to cover it. Do we see peace throughout all the world like that? Do we see all of the nations having peace? Do we see an end to war? Is there no war going on on the face of this earth today? No. There's plenty of war going on. We have our soldiers on foreign soil. We're concerned for their safety. I heard a great program yesterday that's providing sneakers to our soldiers out in the deserts, Afghanistan and other places like that, because their sneakers are wearing out because they've been there so long, and in the heat, they're wearing out fast, and they need better shoes. Why? Because they need to stay there and do battle. We do not have peace over all the world yet. Obviously, the one who came humble and mounted on a donkey was fulfilled in 32 AD, but the one who's going to stop war and who's going to bring peace to all the nations, we don't have a date for that one yet. So you see how in the same scripture, in the same thought, even if it's two different verses together to get the complete thought, we can see many a time when there has been a time gap. So it's nothing foreign to take that thought into Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, and realize Messiah being cut off is at a point in time, and then we're going to see that there's a pickup time coming also. On our way back to Daniel, we're going to go in the wrong direction because we're going to go to Luke. I want you to see, and I told you it was coming, we're going to go to Luke chapter 4, and we'll start with verse 16. Luke 4. And start with verse 16. Now this is when Yeshua was on this earth. This is the one he's talking about. So when verse 16 says he came to Nazareth, we're talking about when Yeshua himself came to Nazareth. If you backed up, you would see verse 14 tells you he returned to Galilee. And it says that there Yeshua, Jesus, returned to Galilee. 15, he began teaching the synagogues. Verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. We know Yeshua Jesus grew up as a boy in Nazareth. That was his hometown. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath. That's what all good Jewish people did. They went to the synagogue on their Shabbat. He stood up to read, and he was given, what handed to him was the book of the prophet Isaiah. Now here again, I love the Lord's timing. Okay? He just happened to go into the synagogue on this Shabbat, he just happened to be handed the scroll of Yeshia. Just happened, right? <laughs> if you've been with me, you know that there are portions that are always read that are called the Haftor, that come out of the prophets. They read a portion of the Torah, which is Genesis through Deuteronomy. They read that in order every year. They read it complete. We just started Davarim. We just started Deuteronomy this week. All of our Jewish people who are following that. And when we get to the end of Deuteronomy, we're going to roll up that scroll and we're going to start all over again in Bereshit Genesis. And they're going to do that, the end and that start in the very same Shabbat. Now, the Haftor, the portion that comes after the Torah, they don't read in order. They jump around and they read different scriptures, but they read the same ones in relation to the, the Parsha portion of the Torah that they're reading. Did Yeshua know what they were reading that day in the synagogue? Absolutely. As he came in, it was often given to a guest the honor of being called up to the, to the Bema, to the place where the, the scrolls were, to read the portion. So that's what happened. He went into the synagogue, he stood up to read because that was the custom. They would stand up, they would read the scripture, showing respect, and he would sit down to teach. That's the way that they did it. We kind of do it backwards. We sit often when we're reading the scriptures, and then our, our pastor or leader who's going to expound on the scripture stands up to teach. So it's just the custom of how the Jewish people did it then, how we're doing it today. But he knew that they were going to give him the, the prophet Isaiah to read, and he opened the book and found the place. He found the portion he was supposed to read, and this is what he read. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of the sight to the blind, set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now, if we went back to the scrolls, we would have it sound like more exactly of the same words than this does, but the understanding is the same. 
He came to set the captives free. He came to, to bring salvation. He came to set free those who were oppressed. He came to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This is the year of the Lord. His work is going forth. He's bringing salvation to you. Everything sounds exactly like what I read to you in Yeshua, Isaiah 61, and it is the portion he was reading. But notice what he did. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, period. And he closed the book, gave it back to the shamash, that's the attendant who would bring the scrolls and take the scrolls, and he sat down. And all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. They were ready for him to teach. Now, remember what I told you to hold on to in Isaiah 61? There was one more phrase in that verse, and that phrase was the day of vengeance of God is upon them. He did not read that verse when he read it here in Luke. He stopped with that phrase. Why did he stop with that phrase? Because that timing wasn't yet. He stopped on the phrase where they were, where at the day, the favorable day of the Lord, the day of salvation. He read it through to the point that was true. And in the part he left off, there's a great gap in time. And that prophecy, that part will be fulfilled. The day of vengeance of our God will come. And we know that day to be called the tribulation. So we know we're still waiting for it. So in these four scriptures alone, we see very often his first and his second coming being pictured. And we see a gap of time in between. Keep that, and let's go back into Daniel. Did you think we'd never get there? <laughs> we're back in Daniel 9, Daniel chapter 9, and uh, I think we're picking up in 27. I'll look at the end of 26 and make sure I don't need to say anything there. But I believe we are ready to go through. Okay, just reading 26 so that we put our mindset there. After the 62 weeks, remember there was a 7 weeks and there was a 62 weeks. That brings it up to 69 weeks, and Messiah will be cut off. We talked about that, have nothing. The people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Rome was a prince who came. Rome destroyed the city. Rome destroyed the temple. We know that, okay? And its end will come with a flood. We talked about how that's an army. We saw how flood runs all over the land like an army that, that, that's coming to invade. Even to the end, there will be war. Okay, there's still war going on. We haven't hit that end. Desolations are determined. There's going to be something that makes it desolate. That's what we all saw, what we looked at last week. And now, now is where we continue. We pick up in verse 27. We're still referring to verse 26. Remember, they didn't have verses to stop on. It was one continuous writing. And so when we read in verse 27, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Who is the he referring to? Is an antecedent. We're taking that he back to verse 26 to see who it's talking about because actually in the Hebrew, we don't have that pronoun. We just have what is going to happen. Uh, we just have and will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. The he helps us understand and is referring back to verse 26, the prince who is to come will destroy the city, he'll destroy the sanctuary, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Well, obviously, we're not talking about the same person, because that person would have to be 2,000 years old right now. Titus uh, destroyed the sanctuary in 70 AD. We're in 2020 AD. So obviously, we're not talking about that very person, but we're talking about that was the Roman Empire. The, out of the Roman Empire, only we call it the revived Roman Empire, will come this one who is going to make a peace treaty. He's going to make, a, a, well, I just kind of tipped my hand there, didn't I? He's going to make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Okay? Now, he is going to be making something firm. The Hebrew gives room to be, um, oh, what's the word I want? Making stronger something that's already there on the table. Okay, so it can be that he's starting it from scratch, writing something brand new, or it can be that he's taking something that we see the, the infrastructure of, we see the, the, um, the, the, the looseness of it. He's going to tighten it up and make it something strong and make it something firm. Okay, um, in our Hebrew translation, it's, he will cause to prevail the covenant. 
So the idea that we're given, again, is that there's a covenant there, and he's going to make it prevail. He's going to make this work. Very likely what he's doing is he's promising protection. He's promising religious freedom to the Jewish people in, allegiance, in return for their allegiance. It might be that he'll put in there, and I'm not saying it has to be this way, but it could be. It might be that he'll put in there, they can rebuild their temple. Now, it may have already been started, so it may not be that it's that, and that's why I want to be very specific on that. We don't know, again, is he starting absolutely from scratch? It kind of sounds like not. It sounds like he takes something that's there, a precursor, and makes it stronger, okay? Now, who is he making this covenant with? We know that he's coming out of the Roman Empire, or literally out of the Revive, because we know that we're moving down into the Ten Toes, and when you take all of Daniel's prophecies, and you go with Revelation, you see that in its entirety. I'd have to spend a whole other week or two just talking on that. But if you haven't been with me in Revelation or in Daniel, go to the tapes that are there and give all that detail. For here, I'm just hitting the highlights. So, we have that he's confirming or making stronger or bringing together this covenant with the many. Remember, in the book of Daniel, the many is referring to Daniel's people, is referring to the Jewish people. So he is making a covenant with Israel. Now let me give you a little more proof of that, okay? Again, I, I, like, to, oops, I like to let scripture interpret scripture. Okay, whoops, I'm trying to get, here we go. Um, okay, I am going to go to Isaiah again, Yeshia. Oh, that's why I can't get it to do it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I'm getting my fingers twisted here backwards. We're going to Isaiah 52. Okay. Yeshaya chapter 52. And we're going to look at verse 14. Isaiah 52 and verse 14 says, Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Okay. Verse 13 it had told us he's talking about my servant. This is the precedent into Isaiah chapter 53, which we know speaks of Messiah. It's the Lamb of God who's, who sacrificed for the sins of the people. So we have here just as many, just as the Jews were astonished at you, my people, you Jewish people, many of you were astonished by this. We see that it's calling the many the Jewish people. When we read in verse, I think it's 12, and I'm looking for it on chapter 53. Um, yes, yes, it is there. I had to read far enough. Okay, 53, 12, flip your page. He's gone through the crucifixion in this picture, and he has been buried with, um, with the rich. We know Yeshua was buried in a rich man's tomb. Even that was fulfilled. Verse 12, I allot him a portion with the great or with the rich. He will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death. He's, God is saying here he's going to be victor. This death is just temporary. This is not the end. He was numbered with the transgressors. He, he took on the sin of the world. He became the sin sacrifice for us. Yet he himself bore the sin of many. In that context, he's talking about bearing the sins of the Jewish people. Remember, this chapter is talking about the Jewish people. Um, it's talking about where he came out of. He came out of the root of Jesse. If you keep it in its context, we see that. doesn't mean for a moment that he didn't die for the Gentiles, too. He did. He took on the sin of the world. Not the sin of the Jews only, but the sin of the world. But I'm just showing you the word many again here in context is talking about the Jewish people. Let's go to Daniel again. Go back to Daniel. But go this time to chapter 11. We'll come back to 9 in just a moment. But go to chapter 11 and go to verse 44. And let me tell you, chapter 11 tells us a lot about the Antichrist. And his major battle that is um, very near the end of the tribulation time. Chapter 11, verse 44 only is what I want to look at for right now. It says, but rumors from the east and the north will, not, will disturb him. They'll disturb the Antichrist. They'll go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. In Daniel's book, we know he's talking about the Jewish people. If he backed up in this chapter, you would see how all the kingdoms and nations of the world are converging on Israel to take out Israel, to take a spoil from Israel to win that victory. So 
in Isaiah, in Daniel, and other places, we have that the many is referring to the Jewish people. Keeping that in mind, go back to chapter 9 now, and go back to verse 27, where we were. And we have then that he is confirming this covenant with many, okay, with the Jewish people for one week. Now, it's very interesting. Daniel has given us seven weeks, and then he's given us 62 weeks. Seven plus 62 is 69 weeks. But remember, we were told 77s are determined on your people, Daniel. So we have one more period of seven, one more 70th week that's missing unless it's being talked about right here. Does it fit? Well, he's going to confirm the covenant with the Jewish people, so it hits right on being that this is in relation to the Jewish people, and it just happens to be for one week. Ding, 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 ding. I think we have our 70th week of Daniel without anyone arguing that. We've got two, uh, seven, 62, and now we have our final week. As we go on, as we look at the rest of it, we will know that we are exactly right on target. Here is our 70th week of Daniel. He has confirmed the covenant at the start of it. It's going to be seven years. We'll see that as we go on because it tells us in the middle of the week. Okay, what's the middle of seven? I have good mathematicians, three and a half, <laughs> okay? At the three and a half year point, if the week is seven years long, the very middle is three and a half years, okay? And in the middle of this week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Now, if he was talking about the Gentiles, when do they do sacrifices and grain offerings? That's very Jewish terminology. It's taking place where? In the temple. It's not taking place right now because the Jewish people don't have a temple right now. They don't have a place to do sacrifice. But remember, he's going to allow them to rebuild their temple. We even think that might be the start of that covenant, that false peace. You Jewish people, build your temple. We'll let you build it. You've been wanting to. I think maybe they'll even find the quote, bring out, because I think they've already found it. The Ark of the Covenant is going to be a big deal. Hey, you've got your Ark. Build it. Make your holy place. Now, the whole time he is doing that, he is thinking, they're going to go in to worship that. I'm going to take over one day. I'll let them build the whole thing. I'll let them do all the work. I'll let them get it all fixed up. And then I'm going to step in, usurp it. I'm going to sit there and they're going to have to worship me. He's not doing it because he really likes the Jewish people. He's doing it because he's using them for his gain. That's what the Antichrist does. He uses everything, everybody, for his gain. We'll see that he will be hand in hand with, with the uh, harlot that rides the beast. And then when he's done with the harlot, he's done with her. He'll strip her. He'll take all of her wealth and he'll bring it in for himself. That's Revelation 17, goes into Revelation 18. That's another lesson also. But here we have, staying on track. In the middle of the week, he puts a stop to the sacrifice and to the grain offering. So we know that the covenant had to have included in it, if not the establishing of the temple, the continuation of temple worship. So the temple has been rebuilt by three and a half years. Now, if we see the temple being built, do not panic. Remember, I made it very clear. It may not be that that's the start of it. It may be just the continuation, but we may not. I think it's even far more likely we will be taken out of the way. They will bring out their Ark of the Covenant, and the temple will be rebuilt very, very early in the first days of that uh, tribulation period. Again, who is behind the Antichrist? We know it's Satan. We know that Satan even brings his false trinity himself antichrist and the false prophet to be his counterfeit to god the father god the son and god the holy spirit the three in one satan has always wanted worship from the beginning that's his problem he wanted the worship he wanted the place of god in heaven and that's what got him dethroned from heaven and the angels who wanted him to be their god went with him sadly sadly so so who how is satan going to get worship he gives it to the Antichrist. It gives the Antichrist the ability to build, to be brought into a place, to demand worship. 
but then we know he's going to indwell the Antichrist to get that worship himself. So who is he going to work through? He is not going to work through the Jew who is worshiping the one true and living God. Even if they don't know Messiah, they're worshiping the one true and living God. That's not who he would go through. But in Muslim worship, and I'm not calling out Muslims, I'm calling out the religion. Well, Muslims are religion. They're not a nationality. But you know what I'm trying to say. Allah is their God. Allah tells them to kill their enemy. Kill the Jew, kill the Christian, kill their enemy. What does our Lord tell us? Love your enemy. Do good to those who mistreat you. He tells us to reach out to them. But for Satan to get that world worship that he's wanted from the beginning, he's going to work through this one who in essence is already worshiping him because his allegiance is to Allah, not unto the one true and living God. Now, who makes up those who worship Allah as a whole are the Arab population. Again, hear me, I'm not counting out all people, but I'm telling you the same way the Jews in, in general, we talk about worshiping the one true and living God, even when they don't know Yeshua. We know that the Muslims are worshiping the God called Allah, and we know that most of the Arab world makes up this population. So even by default, that would sound like the one who is leading this covenant with the many would be a Muslim, or at least of Arab descent. Okay? Now, we know this also. A peace treaty is made between two who are enemies, right? That's just basic. You don't make a peace treaty with someone you're not at war with. You make a peace treaty with someone who is your enemy. How could a Jew make a peace treaty with a Jew? And what would that matter to the world even if they did? It makes no sense at all. It's not anything that would carry any weight anywhere outside of the land of Israel, and it would not bring about one day of peace. Who is keeping there from being peace in the Holy Land in Israel today? It is not Jew against Jew. It is Jew against Arab. And I don't mean all of them because there are many Israeli Arabs, as they are called, who hold office in the Knesset, who live in peace with the, their Israeli neighbors, who you can't tell them apart. <laughs> they are friendly. So I'm not talking about all of them, but I'm talking about in general. The enemy of Israel is Arab, and it would take an Arab making a peace treaty then with the Jew for there to be a reason for a peace treaty, okay? Another reason why I see that the Antichrist has got to be of Arab descent. If he's Jewish descent, honestly, the Arabs will want nothing to do with him. The Jewish people would be the only ones who would trust him. So, you're going to ask me a good question. How then are the Jews going to trust an Arab? Aren't they smarter than that? Don't they know? Doesn't Netanyahu now know that he has nobody to be a peace partner with him because they lie to him, they don't keep their word, they're taught a lie justifies the means, do anything that you need to do to get to the end that you want. And we know that most of the, the mantra of the Arab world is to push Israel off into the Mediterranean Sea. They don't want P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace with Israel. They want the peace, P-I-E-C-E, -E, called Israel. And we know that for a fact. So why are the Jewish people going to be so stooped? I know I say stupid. <laughs> so stooped as to accept a peace treaty with the Antichrist. Well, I can tell you for a number of reasons. Number one. As a whole, the Jewish people today are very tired of war. There's hardly a family, if there's a family in Israel, that's not touched by war. There are so many that are so tired of their money needing to go to war, their boys and girls needing to go to war, the, the killing that's constant, that they want peace at almost any cost. That's how they gave back the Gaza Strip. Did it get them peace? Thank you very much. It got them a, a problem in their very side. But they try and they try and they try again. Right now, without calling out names, we've got a political party that is um, sharing the next four years split time. Sometimes it's, it's uh, Likud's government and sometimes it's Labor's government that will be in the head charge position. When Likud is in there, Likud is saying we're not making, we're, we're standing strong. We're, we don't have a, a player for peace. We're not going to give back any more land. In fact, we're going to claim all Jerusalem is ours. 
Then this other party comes up that's labor, and labor says, we're tired of war. You want half of Jerusalem? You want the east part of Jerusalem? You can have it. Let's just do it so that we can have peace. How they could think it'll buy them peace when it never has before is beyond me. But when they're desperate for it, when it's been their children's blood that's been shed, when it's been <coughs> their beloved mate that's been killed, it works on their psyche. The young generation that's growing up now, that's living in the South, that has to hide in the safe room within seconds when the rocket blare goes and they get warned of those rockets day after day after day, not just once in the day, sometimes the number of times in a day, sometimes 20 times in a day. Have, try living life. Try putting a cake in the oven and now you've got to rush for your, your safe room and hope you get in there in time cake will burn up. You can't even do a cake. You can't do, how can you teach a class? How can you have life? They're so tired of it. They're going to want peace. And they're almost going to want it at any cost. Now, let's add one more level into this equation here. And that is this, remember I said Satan's making his false trinity? We've got Satan. We've got the Antichrist. Who's the third partner to make this false trinity like we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? The third part is the one that goes by the title false prophet. And as was brought out earlier, prophet is a very Jewish word. The Jewish people have their prophets through scripture. Listen to your prophets. I just read from the prophet Yeshaya, Zechariah. Who else have I read from today? Maybe just those two, but we know many prophets. This one is going to be Jewish. This one is going to work hand in hand with the Antichrist. He is either duped by the Antichrist or he is a partner with him. However you want to look at it, he's going to think, hey, this is the only way to peace. That's why I see something coming up in the Labor Party as one who would be very likely to work with the Antichrist, thinking is our only chance for peace. This other way hasn't worked for all these years. Let's try this not realizing how foolish they're being to put their hand into the hand of one who is a chameleon, who is not showing who he is. But this one, being Jewish, working with the Antichrist, working for a time, and Antichrist makes it look good. They get to build their temple. They get to start their sacrifices. They get to go on, and it looks like they're really getting peace. He, the false prophet, will help the Jewish people we can trust this one. This is the one we've been looking for. This is the one who really will be a partner with us. And because he's Jewish, they will listen to him. Because he's a leader in Israel, they will listen to him. And remember, the lie is sent out so strong that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. They're not going to see the truth. It's going to be like they've got smoke in their eyes and they see a smoke screen and they don't realize it's the same way that you put the frog in the fire. If you put him in hot water, he jumps right out and he doesn't die. But if you put him in the pan of water and it's cold and you slowly turn up the heat, you get to fry that frog. That's what's going on. Israel's been brought in slowly and duped into it and stays there and thinks, hey, this is working and the Antichrist will make it look good until when? We just told you, until the middle of the week. In the middle of the week, he's got things set up enough. He's ready that if you don't have his mark, you can't buy and you can't sell. You can't do commerce. You can't live. You're going to starve to death or you're going to be beheaded or whatever. It's not going to bode well for you. He's ready for that. He puts that into action. And as I said before, no one takes that mark by accident. No one thinks that that's just, oh, well, i got to do it be, like I'm buying a business license. No. They know taking that mark is pledging allegiance to the beast. That is that they are saying, I am not giving myself to the one who created me. I'm not giving it myself to the Messiah or to the living God of Israel. I am pledging allegiance. Pledging allegiance to the Antichrist. I am siding with him. I am joining with him. That's all what comes down here in the middle of this week. We know that from Matthew 24. We know it from Revelation. Um, 11 has the two witnesses. Uh, 
So somewhere past 11, it comes up with the mark. Uh, might be 13, might be in 13. Anyway, we can look for the, the chapter later. So in the middle of the week, he puts a stop to the sacrifices that are taking place in the temple. The grain offerings that are being brought in. Um, and let me show you. Yeah, let me stop right there before we go to that next phrase. Let me give you a little bit more, okay? We've said he's Arab. We've said he's probably of Muslim descent. We uh, also are making a very clear satan. Satan gives his power. Let me prove this. Revelation 13 and verse 4. So we're going to go, we're going to go there. Um, we'll see if it's got a mark in there too while well, well, we're in a hurry there if I can. Uh, Revelation 13 and verse 4. And if I start with 13, we have a beast coming up out of the sea in chapter 13. A little later when I get a chance, if I do, well, we are getting short on time, um, maybe I should show you right now that the sea refers to the Gentile nations. Um, let me take that little sidetrack. Um, let me give you some verses here that will go with that. Revelation 13, 4, well, we're getting to there. We have this beast that comes up out of the sea. The beast has ten heads and uh, ten horns, seven heads, okay? We know from the description of other places, this is the kingdoms that are giving their power to the Antichrist. Remember, we have the toads. We've got ten nations. We have them all giving their power to um, the beast. So we see this. We see what that beast is like in verses 2 uh, and 3. But we also see something in particular in relation to what I was just talking about. And that is, I'm in the wrong, no wonder I can't find it. <laughs> okay. Um, what we are seeing, and I'm sorry I sidetracked myself, what I was saying. Uh, oh, Satan, remember, is the one wanting worship. He has wanted it from before the, the creation of Adam. He has been looking for that. He has been trying to get that for himself. And so what we see in verse 4 shows us he's finally getting worship because it says in verse 4, 2 and 3 describing the beast. Then verse 4, they worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. We know from Revelation 12, verse 9, that the dragon is a name for Satan. It spells it all the way out. It gives several names for Satan, and it makes it very, very clear. Um, um, let me give it to you. I've got another Bible here I can open real quickly, and I'll read you Revelation 12, 9. So you can flip back if you've got the old-fashioned. My tablet, I can't do it that easily. Revelation 12, 9 says, the great dragon, and that's what we just read here, they worshiped the dragon, okay? The great dragon who was cast out, this time up and cast out of heaven, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So no question about who the dragon in chapter 13 is, chapter 12 identified him, the devil, Satan, the one cast out of heaven, and his angels with him. We know who this is. So they worshipped the dragon. Notice it didn't say that they worshipped the beast. They're worshipping the dragon because Satan is accepting that worship for himself. He's using that of Christ as his boy to get this worship that he wanted. They, they worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. How did the beast get so powerful? One world ruler, one world power, making the whole world take his mark. Stop and really think about it. Sometimes we get so used to what we read, we don't stop and think. Right now, I see the pandemic showing us for the first time how the world is having to relate to each other. We have to behave in California because it affects us in Europe. Europe has to behave because it affects them if they want to go to Australia. We have the whole world having to pay attention to a simple little virus, COVID-19, a, a virus that, that you can't even see that's causing world manipulation. Okay, that would be a mind blower a year ago. If anybody told you in 2019 what would be happening in 2020, you would have scoffed. That wouldn't happen. And a lot of people in the United States would have said, well, the United States will never go along with that. Hello. Where are we now? We see very easily the preparation by the power of Satan to bring this world into his subjection. Because remember, it's what he's been after all along. Remember, God gave him the earth. The earth was his kingdom. He walked up and down on the face of the earth. We read this in Ezekiel um, 28 and Isaiah 14. He is his kingdom, it's his power when this 
is found in him this pride that I will be like the Most High God. I will sit in the side of the north. I will receive worship. Ay, 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 oy, gavalt. Ay, ay, this, and he's, he's cast out from it. He loses his kingdom. God takes his kingdom away from him. Then we have what we know as the creation in, in Bereshit, Genesis 1 and 2, and we have that God put man in his garden. He put man eastward in Eden. We see this ties in with, what, with Satan's kingdom. And what we realize is God put man over the kingdom that we call earth, originally called Eden, originally under Satan's control until he fell from his pride. So is Satan going to say, wow, I blew it. I'm going to sit in the corner like a good little boy and I'm going to accept my punishment and I'm going to repent of my ways. No. He flies in the face of God, still to this day, and has the audacity to think he can thwart God's plan. So God, you gave my kingdom to man, I'm going to get it back. And he wiggles his way in like a serpent, cunning and deceitful, and he gets the woman to, by deception, listen to him, eat from the tree that was forbidden that she might be as wise as God, yeah, her eyes were open, not, not to be as wise as God, but now she knew good and evil. Now there was not an innocence. Now there had to be a punishment for sin because sin has been brought into this world and the consequences are living out to this day. And we see Adam fell with Eve, that he took it willingly where she was deceived. Satan grabbed back the title deed of the earth when he caused Adam to fall. But it's not over. He's battling to hold on to that deed. He thinks it's his, he wants it to be his, and he's trying to rule mankind, and he's going to go to all this point of uniting them under the Antichrist to receive the worship, but God still has the final word. And remember who really is holding the grant deed to the earth? Who does it belong to? Yeshua, Jesus. We see it in Revelation 5, the one that appears like the lamb slain, but who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lion is a roaring king of the jungle. This one was able to take the deed from the hand of the Father who is able to break open the seals. That's only done by the one who owns it. When it's broken open, those seals poured out on the earth show it is title deed to the earth. And where Yochanan had cried because no one was worthy, no one was able to open the title deed, Yeshua was able to because he bought back planet earth with his blood. He redeemed mankind from the curse of sin. He broke that and brought them eternal life. Those who believe in him are the victors with him. And the earth is his to do with as he pleases. All of this scene, all of this is what's going on. But here in chapter 13 and verse 4, we have they worship the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who will be able to wage war with him? Well, you want the question answered to who can wage war with him? Go to chapter 19 of Revelation and see the one who comes from heaven, regal now, royal, on that white horse with a sword proceeding out of his mouth, annihilates the Antichrist, puts a stop to the war of the Battle of Armageddon, the mother of all wars, the battle that's going on from the north of Israel to the south of Israel. And we see him coming in several stops, finally, culminated in the Mount of Olives where he puts his feet down on the Mount of Olives that cleaves into the north to the south, the east to the west. This whole valley is opened up and as we follow through in chapter 20, we find that this is where he sets up his kingdom in this new huge sized valley that was made by him coming back and stopping the war. But before he makes that kingdom, he takes that Antichrist and he casts him into the lake of fire. And along with him, he goes the false prophet. They are the only two throughout all time that we read do not stand at the great white throne judgment to be judged for their, their works, their ways, and their sins. Every other man who does not accept the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus for salvation stands at the great white throne judgment. But apparently God felt their sin so strong, so unforgivable, so obvious that he doesn't even take the time to bring them up before that judgment. He sends them cast into the lake of fire where they will be forever. When Satan joins them, it's at the end of the thousand years. 
where we see that it tells us prior to that thousand years, the Antichrist and the false prophet are cast in. A thousand years later, when Satan is cast in, it says where the beast and the false prophet are. That shows us it's not annihilation, it's not ending, it's not there until they're burned up. It goes on forever. It's eternal separation from the holy God, from a loving God, from all that is peace and good and, and glorious. And it's a place of torment and suffering forever and ever. They deserve it for deceiving mankind. They deserve it for coming up in the face of my God. But the same way, anyone who has the audacity to say to God, well, I could say to myself, I was a good person. I lived a good life. They are worthy also because they are flying in the face of God and saying, your way is not right. Your way is not perfect. And they are not a friend of God. If they are not willing to bow the knee to worship God and declare Him God in their life, they are His enemy. There is no in-between. We talk about an in-between. We talk about being on the fence, but literally, there isn't. If their life is snuffed from them when they're on that fence that we're talking about, they have not chosen to stand with God through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, then they are the enemy, and they are cut off forever the same way. This is serious. This is not anything to be taken lightly. The only chance to choose to be on God's side is in this life now. When you leave this earth, your eternal destination is sealed forever. You either go into the presence of eternal God forever, or you go into the presence of suffering forever. Don't take it lightly. Don't think you can bargain with God. Don't think you can reason it out and come up with any excuse. Go look through the scriptures, and you will find your excuse somewhere in there and that they fell short. The only way, and Yeshua said it, the only way to the Father is through me. Not me, Yeshua Jesus speaking. Through him, through his shed blood on the cross. His Amen. perfect blood placed on the mercy seat for all mankind. All they have to do is accept it. That's it. Don't let pride get in your way. The same way Satan, it cost him his kingdom and it cost him his eternity. Don't let it cost you. Get to that point where you can say, you know what, I might not like the rules, God, but you made them, you made this world, you made these rules, and I don't want to be found coming up against you. Come into that place, and I believe me, he'll open up your heart to love him and to want him, to want to worship him, and the best is yet to be. Amen. What more can I say? Back on track because we want to be able to finish what we are saying here. Um, I'm showing you how the, the Antichrist takes over at the middle of the tribulation. It's because he has the power from Satan to do this. Go with me to Matthew 24. We're only going to look at, at verse 15, so no worries. Those of you who know I can stay here on Matthew 24, I won't today. I'm going to read one verse to you. Matthew 24, we know, gives us the signs. That was the question. The Talmudim came to Yeshua. What's going to be the end of the age? What's going to be the sign of your coming? You're telling us the temple's going to be destroyed. Wait a minute. What about you setting up the kingdom? And he goes through this dissertation that we have recorded in 24, telling us very much in order. Follow it in order. By the end of 24, you have the second coming because you have uh, Messiah coming and can be seen like lightning from the east to the west. That's his second coming. But in verse 15, we are told, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of through Daniel the prophet, right where we're studying, we're going to go back and look at that abomination of desolation in verse 27 of Daniel 9. When you see it standing in the holy place, and that means the, the holy of holies in the temple, that's the only holy place, then those who are in Judea must flee. Okay, so we are being told in verse 15, there is going to be an abomination that makes desolate. Okay, desolate means if something's desolate, nobody's living there. Everybody is scattered from there. It's gone. It's desolate. Something is so abominable. This abomination is going to make it desolate. Well, we're told here that it's standing in the holy place. Daniel's going to tell us more about that. Let me take you to 2 Thessalonians 2.4. 2 Thessalonians 2, you need to study the whole chapter to get the whole picture of everything, but we're just going to go to verse 4 because we're only talking about what we're looking at right now. And we're being told that there's this lawless man 
the man of lawlessness who opposes and exalts himself above God, so that, or every so-called God, or every object of God. In fact, I'm reading it. Let me back up, okay? Start with verse 4. This one that we're, we've been talking about, we call him the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Okay, we're starting to put the pieces together. We're told there's an abomination that's going to make it desolate. That's going, when you see it happen in the holy place, get out of town. Okay, the holy place is the temple. Something, an abomination is going to come into the temple. It's going to cause everybody to leave the temple, to flee. Here in verse 4, we're being told this one, this lawless man, this one that we've been talking about today, this Antichrist, he's going to oppose everything else that's being worshipped. He's going to set himself up taking the seat for God himself in the temple so that he is being displayed and he basically is saying, I am God, worship me. That's what's happening. I should have told you to hold on to Revelation 13. Go back there real quickly or just listen and I'll read it to you. Revelation chapter 13 where we were talking about that beast, verses 14 and 15. Now a little later in that chapter, he, this beast, who deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, okay? It's talking about there's two beasts in chapter 13. One comes out of the sea, one comes out of the land. By the way, I didn't give you the scriptures for the sea. stands for Gentile nations in scripture. I'm running out of time, so i um, kind of closed it. Let me see if I can give you references, but we can, we'll see if we go next week or, or if you just look it up on your own. Um, I gotta find it again because I closed my. Uh, here we go. Okay, Isaiah 8, 7, and 8. Isaiah 17, 12, and 13. Isaiah 60 and verse 5. These all show us that when it's talking about the sea, it's talking about Gentile population. Matthew 13, 47 to 49. And Luke 21, 25. I can give those again. We'll probably look at one of them to prove my point, but let me get this full point out here first in Revelation 13, uh, 14, and 15. We're talking about the false prophet, the beast that came out of the land. Now, if the sea represents Gentile nations, who do you think the land represents? And when we talk about the land, the land is all about the land. What land do you naturally think of? Israel. So the beast that comes out of the land is Jewish. The beast that comes out of the sea is Gentile. So the beast that comes out of the sea is a head one that's taking on the place of worship. The beast who comes up out of the land, we call him the false prophet. He is the one who gives, who here in verse 13 performs great signs, even makes fire come down out of heaven in the presence of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast. So with the beast giving him the kudos and the ability saying, do it, do it, do it, the false prophet is performing this miracle that, that fools the Jewish nation to think, hey, this is right. We've seen power like this before. And he's telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and comes to life. Okay, it looks like, like he had died and he's come back to life. And this false prophet goes so far, it says it was given to him, to the false prophet, to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So that image that's put into the temple, that the Antichrist is declaring, worship it because it's an image of me. When you worship it, you're worshiping me. The false prophet is going to give that image life fake life, but he's going to make it look real. It's going to look like it can speak and it can talk, although it's just stone or whatever they choose to make it out of. This is the false prophet with power making a false sign, a false wonder, a false miracle so that the, they will follow along and worship this one who has set himself up to be worshipped now. Revelation 11, 1 and 2 ties in with this. In Revelation 11, we have um, two witnesses that are going to come up but what's important is the first two verses the first one an angel was given a measuring rod like a staff he was told to measure the temple of god and the altar and those who worship in it so the tension's being drawn to the place of worship the holy of holies in the temple in verse 2 it says leave out the court which is outside the temple 
don't measure it, for it's given to the nations. They will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Okay, so there's something happening in the Holy of Holies that's changing the worship there. When you know that that's happening, at the same time, don't measure the court on the outside where the court of the Gentiles are, the court that's given to the nations, to the Gentiles, to the seas, the seas being the people, because they, the Gentiles, are going to tread the Jewish holy nation, the holy city, which we know is Jerusalem, for 42 months. Now, remember I asked you what's the middle of seven years, and you said three and a half years? How many months are three and a half years? 42 months. Ding, ding, ding. We've got the same thing. When the abomination is put in the holy place, it's the same time where, where we're being told here that temple in Jerusalem is going to be trodden underfoot by Gentile, by the, the Antichrist himself, to accept the worship for three and a half years. Until, basically, the Lord comes back and stops it gets rid of the Antichrist, really literally gets rid of his temple too. He doesn't just clean it up. He starts new, builds a glorious temple that we read in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter um, 40. Let me just give you um, one proof of uh, the Gentiles being represented by, the, or the nations by the sea. I'm going to start with my first one and hope it built my case good on the first one. If not, we'll go to the second one. So Isaiah 8 was what I mentioned first, verses 7 and 8. We looked at this one last week, so maybe it's a good one to go to. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord is about to bring on them, on Israel, okay, for judgment, the strong and abundant waters of the Euphrates, even the king of Assyria in all his glory. So God just used the river of Euphrates, and like a river would run over its banks and take over. He's saying the king of Assyria in all his glory is going to do this. Well, the king of Assyria is Gentile. He's going to come, and he's going to capture Jerusalem. He's going to capture Israel. He's going to capture the Jewish people. And here it talks about it being a channel, overflowing its banks, sweeping through Judah, overflowing, even comes to the neck. Remember we talked about that last week, that he won't let Israel die. He won't let her be cut off, totally destroyed. But this is like, like the sea, okay? Gentiles um, being represented here because this is Israel suffering at the hands of the Gentiles because of being disobedient to their God. And if you go to the other verses, again, I'm really fighting time because I think I can tie it up if I don't stop here. So let me hit on you since I gave you those verses. We'll come back to them at the very end if we have time. If you have any questions with them, let me know. But otherwise, let's go back to Daniel 9 real quick so that we can finish it off. And let me show you. Did I get back to it? I did. Okay. Um, we're talking now in the middle of the week. That he puts his image into the temple now. He stops the sacrifice and the grain offering. And then we read the expression, On the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Okay, remember Matthew 24, 15 said, The abomination that makes desolate. The abomination of desolation is the title we give it. We're talking the same language here. So at that midpoint, when something happens to stop the sacrifices and to make this temple desolate, this is an abomination in, to the Lord, is what he's saying. So what's an abomination in Scripture? Let me take you, we'll come right back to Daniel, but let me take you to Deuteronomy, Davarim. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And if you don't have time to look it up, just write down the verses. Deuteronomy 7, verses 25 and 26. And I read for you there. The graven images of their gods you are to burn with fire. You shall not covet the silver or the gold that is on them, nor take it for yourselves, or you'll be snared by it. It'll be a trap for you. Nor take it for yourself. Oops, I read that. For it is an abomination to the Lord your God. What's the abomination? Graven images of the gods of the people they were going to conquer. A graven image, an idol made out of silver, made out of gold, this is an abomination to the Lord. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 16 and 17. Deuteronomy 29, verses 16 and 17, and we read there, whoops. For you know how we lived in the land of Egypt, how we came through the midst of the nations which you passed. Moreover, 
you have seen their abominations. Okay, Egypt's abominations. And it goes on and says what they are. They're idols of wood, stone, silver, and gold, which they had with them. So here it's very clear. An abomination to the Lord is an idol that is being worshipped. No matter what it's made out of, it is an idol, anything that you make. We can make idols out of anything today. But in scripture, what it's talking about is idolatry in worship. Keep that in mind. Go back on your way toward Daniel 9, but we're going to go just past it to Daniel chapter 11 again. Daniel um, 11 and verse 31. And in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 31, we read, Forces from him will arise. Now, if I backed up, we've got the point in time when all the nations are coming together. The one who is heading this is, or the one that they're coming at, you know, is the Antichrist. So, forces from the Antichrist will arise. Desecrate the sanctuary, sanctuary fortress. We know he has desecrated the temple. Do away with the regular sacrifice. We already read that the Antichrist was going to do this. And then here's the phrase. And they will set up the abomination of desolation. Remember, the false prophet is going to help them worship the Antichrist. He's going to make that image, that idol in the temple, look like it's alive. They're going to wonder, wow, that's it's alive. We need to worship it. And they will bow and worship it. Daniel chapter 12, the very next chapter, and then we'll go back to 9, Daniel chapter 12, and verse 11, we have here also, from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished, that's that midpoint, and the abomination of desolation is set up, the image to be worshipped, the idol to be worshipped. From the, from the time of that, the regular sacrifice being abolished and the abomination set up, there will be, and this time it gives it to us in days, 1,290 days. Now, how many months is 1,290 days? 42 months. How many years is 42 months? Three and a half years. Do we have the same thing just given to us in a different phrase? Absolutely. So we know now, back in chapter 9, back in chapter 9, when we read, that there is something that comes into this temple in the middle of the week, um, stops the sacrifices, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes it desolate. One who is going to make it, your scripture might even say, it's going to make the temple desolate. What is this abomination? The idol of the Antichrist being put in there to be worshipped. And it's going to happen that it will make the temple desolate. The, the Orthodox Jews will not go there and worship. They're not going to worship the image. They want to worship God, not the image. So they're going to have to flee. The believers are going to flee also because they know what's happening. And it says from that point, this one who makes that desolate, even until a complete destruction, or you may have even until a determined or a decree, the judgment is going forth. There is going to be this complete destruction one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So when you see all this happen, there is a decree, there is a judgment that is going to be poured out on the Antichrist, on the desolator, on the appaller, on the one who makes it desolate, that's the Antichrist. How do I know what's being poured out is God's wrath, God's judgment, his indignation, because we see that word will be poured out, okay, it says the complete destruction, when that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. In closing, because I know I'm over time, here are the verses that show us what poured out means. Go with me to Jeremiah 42, Jeremiah chapter 42. And verse 18, and I will read it there for you. And one other verse in Jeremiah to prove verse my 13. point. 18. 18. Chapter 42, verse 18. For thus is the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as my anger and wrath have been poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so my wrath will be poured out on you when you enter Egypt. Okay, so anger and wrath are being poured out. The anger and wrath that are being poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, God says it's his anger. We know that that's what he's saying. He's going to pour out his anger, his wrath on the Antichrist. Look at 44 and verse 6. 
Jeremiah chapter 44 and verse 6. Therefore, my wrath and my anger were being poured out and burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, so that they have become a ruin and a desolation as it is to this day. We saw that happen in, in uh, Yermia's time when Babylon destroyed. We saw it happen again when Titus destroyed. We know that Antichrist is now the one who put his image in that made the temple desolate, but now God pours out his wrath on the Antichrist. When he sets it up, it's as if God says, enough is enough. And he starts pouring out his wrath and his indignation on the Antichrist that will finally culminate in the return of Messiah when he puts a stop to the Antichrist. 100% holy ends the Antichrist and he's cast into the lake of fire. That is Daniel's 70th week. We have just completed it. Uh, if you didn't realize, we went all the way through verse 27. So what we have in this great prophecy, when we started, we started out in verse 24. And we started out with 70 weeks being determined. By the time we get through this 70th week, through this tribulation period, through to the very end of return of Messiah in all his glory, when we see him come ruling and reigning, we don't see him come lowly on a donkey. We see him come in regality. He comes as king of kings and lord of lords. He comes riding on the horse, which shows triumph. He comes with all the armies of heaven with him. And now, at the end of that time, the end of the tribulation, we're ready to go into the millennium. Now we have the completion that I gave you in verse 24. Transgression is finished. It's an end of sins. There's reconciliation for the iniquity. We know that's the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. He's now going to usher in righteousness on the face of this earth, but we know the righteousness is for everlasting. Seal up the vision. Your whole vision, Daniel, has been complete. It ended with the Antichrist, the one who made the temple desolate. God's wrath poured out on him. Seal up this prophecy. Close it up. Write the end on it. And the anointing of the Most Holy. What does Messiah do right after he destroys the Antichrist, casts him into the lake of fire forever? He sets up his kingdom. He sets up a millennial place of uh, uh, temple worship. He sits in the place of worship, and all the nations come to him to be worshipped. The anointing of the Most Holy on earth, sitting on the throne of David, fulfilling all the promises to Israel. What a prophecy. Wow. I guarantee you, you are at least seven years from the end of it right now because we have the 70th week yet to start. When we are caught up and the clock starts ticking again, God will work through Israel to fulfill what he's promised, everything that we've said, and bring it to that final end where we will now have the complete time of the Gentiles also. The time of the Gentiles does not end at the rapture. The time of the Gentiles continues on. It is a Gentile world ruler called the Antichrist. It goes all the way till we get to Messiah's reign. When Messiah comes back to reign, that's when the time of the Gentile world rule is over. Remember Daniel uh, saw it, Nebuchadnezzar saw it in Daniel, uh, gave the description, a stone cut out without hands brings down that image that's all those Gentile world rulers. The stone cut out without hands is virgin born. It is miraculous birth. The stone crushes all the Gentile empires and then it grows up and is like a whole kingdom itself because that's what Yeshua becomes. The kingdom of God on earth. Remember his prayer to uh, um, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here is the fulfillment. And that's the end of Daniel's 70th week. It sums up all in prophecy. It brings it all to completion. And we have our full picture. I'm sorry for running over time, but I hope I've given you the complete picture. We don't have time to look at the other verses that show the Gentile nations represented by the seas. But again, if you uh, need them again, let me know. Uh, if you have any problems, let me know. Um, I'm going to close in prayer for those who need to scoot, <laughs> and then we'll open it up for questions or comments, okay? Lord God, thank you that you are almighty, that you've made a magnanimous plan from beginning to end, that nothing will 
soar to your plan, nothing will cause it to fall off your perfect timing to not happen. We know every word will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled the same way it was so exact in your first coming. Your second coming will so be. And we thank you that we who believe in you will be coming back with you to rule and to reign from the nation of Israel, specifically from your throne in the holy place in the city of Jerusalem. Thank you that we can trust you to fulfill every word just as you have to this point. We praise you and give you glory forever and ever in the name of our precious and our holy and the strong name of Yeshua Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. I ran us all the way again. I'm sorry.